Well, as I just mentioned, we are studying redemption. <clears throat> and we had just got down at the very bottom of the first page where it says, Grace summarizes God's actions for the salvation of mankind. And we were beginning to look at Ephesians chapter 2. So let's pick up our Bibles and go then to that second chapter. And a marvelous chapter it is. <clears throat> he mentions that there are several terms in this te text that explain the cause of God's actions in behalf of sinners. Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 1 through 8. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for where is workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Of course, you notice how many times he mentions the word grace in that paragraph. Some of the words that he mentions, the terms that is the cause of God's action, verse 4, mercy. God is rich in mercy. Also in verse 4, because of his great love, which he loved us. Then go to the next page. Then he mentions grace twice in verse 5 and in verse 8. By grace you've been saved. Verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And then kindness, verse 7. Uh, that in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So some of God's characteristics there that are the cause of his actions. Love, mercy, grace, kindness. Oh, yes? No, God, that's fine. Yeah, and yeah, in our own way, in our own way, we can't do it. Uh, and it's which goes along with just what C.L. said. Out of this attitude came the gift of salvation. God was in no way; uh, uh, He didn't owe us anything. He didn't, uh, uh, you know, we didn't do anything that would cause Him to say well, these people deserve salvation. So that's why it's called a gift. It's a gift. But grace is not the only factor in redemption. If it were, then every single person would be saved. So let's go to Titus chapter 2. And we'll see where grace is mentioned again. In a different context. Titus chapter 2 beginning in verse 11. And then we'll go back, of course, to Matthew 7. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Make sure everybody has time to get there. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, everybody, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So when we kind of dissect those two verses, we see that the grace of God is what brings salvation. Again, it's a gift, just like Ephesians chapter 2 said. It is a gift, undeserved, unmerited. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing that we've done 
that makes God owe us anything whatsoever. Nothing. Yes. Yeah, good point. That's right. And, and that's, I think, the, the idea of teaching us is something that's kind of forgotten by the world in a sense. Yes, the grace is there, but it's teaching us how we're supposed to come to it. It teaches us. And we have to listen. So it does bring salvation, and it's available to all men. In other words, that grace is available to every single person. There's no exceptions to that. It's available to everybody. But they have to be willing to be taught. They have to be willing to be taught. They have to listen. Which means they have to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And they must live soberly, righteously, and godly. That's what grace teaches us. So, it has appeared to all men. It's available to everybody. It's there for everybody. But... It teaches us how we are to come to grace. And God loves us all. We know that from John 3, 16, from the time we were little. God loves every single person. So no wonder he made his grace available to everybody. Because he loves everybody. But also, Jesus made it very clear that not everybody is going to accept God's gift. You know, we don't have to accept gifts today, do we? We don't have to accept gifts. Someone can give us something. That doesn't mean we have to accept it. Well, that's the way with God's grace. We don't have to accept it, but he's told us how to accept it because he teaches us, going back to Titus chapter 2. So let's go to Matthew 7 and see what Jesus teaches us there. Two different sections there. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, first. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. This, of course, is part of his Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, if grace saved everybody, and that's all there was, then Jesus' words wouldn't make any sense, would they? There wouldn't be a broad way. But Jesus says there are two ways. People choose. People have to make choices. People have to make choices. You can either choose the wide way or you can choose the narrow way, but it's your choice. Grace is at the end of the narrow way. But people have to choose it. Then we go down. Verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, if grace covered every man and all people had to do was to say, I believe that Jesus died for me, then again, they, this verse wouldn't make any sense. Wouldn't make any sense at all. Because these people believed in the Lord. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But now he says, These are the ones that's going to accept God's grace. Those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Because many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who's built his house on the sand." And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. What distinguishes the two people? What's the one thing that distinguishes those two groups of people? I'm sorry. Obedience. 
He makes that crystal clear. You cannot possibly read those verses and think that obedience is not essential. Uh, yeah, a lot of people do. Absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. Something that suits them. Yep, they sure have. Exactly. It's not the same thing anymore. Yes. That's right. That's exactly right. They can come, but they have to make the choice. You know, we can't rope them in. We can't tie them. We can't pick them up and force them. We can't do any of those things. Uh, it has to be uh, their choice. The only thing we can do is give them a choice. Yeah. Because if we, if we don't preach the gospel, they have no choice. That's right. And that's, that's our, that's our uh, job is to preach the gospel. That was one of the things that J.R. and I were talking about yesterday. How we, once, when you preach the gospel, when you teach the gospel to someone... That is that is your fruit. That's your fruit. Once you've done that, then that's what God wants you to do. And you have been faithful to God. What their choice is, is whether they're going to be faithful to God. Not It's not yours. If they respond to it or not respond to it, that's their, their choice. You're not held accountable for it. But you are held accountable for preaching the truth. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Right. Just like the sower, you know, he sows a seed, he goes, he moves on, he doesn't yep. see the plants come up. That's right. Absolutely. So all we can do is just do the best we can. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell another story from yesterday. I'm going to be doing this all day, so you might as well get used to it. Uh, he was talking about that brother Pope who was preaching a gospel, meet, gospel meeting down at Anderson, and this was years ago. Started on April 1st and went through April 30th. I preached 30 days in a row, and not a single person responded as, as far as outwardly becoming a Christian. So at the end, at the April 30th, he told the, the brothers there, to, I think it was that, yeah, it was that, saying, you know, I've preached, you know, 30 days, you know, I, I think I've been here enough, I need to move on. Well, years and years and years later, he was a preaching in a gospel meeting out in California, Brother Pope was. And there was a uh, one of the elders there at the church where he was preaching, uh, talked to him after services, and he said, I know you don't remember me, but I was there at that meeting in Anderson years and years ago. He says, I didn't respond then to the gospel, but he says, I responded because of what you had taught, but I did later. And so that was a long time. He'd end up becoming an elder in the church and all that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's a good example. It's a good example. Uh, and I think that fits in with what we're talking about. You know, we're, we're called to teach and preach as much as we can. And then uh, the increase is, is up to the individual as far as their, their choices about what they're going to do with it. Um, so, moving on. The cost of redemption is his blood. And that's why his blood is so important. Uh, and if, if you... Read in religious circles today the idea among many so-called religious people that uh, Jesus had to shed his blood for redemption is revolting, to use some of their terms. It's revolting. They think it's that we are very backward, uh, almost illiterate in thinking that Christ had to shed his blood. They think that's just a horrible thought. 
But what could be more clearly taught in the New Testament than that? I mean, it's the, one of the most clearly taught uh, principles in all the Bible. Let's look at some of those. Hebrews 9. <clears throat> and we'll begin in verse 11. And we'll end up in chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? How much more will Christ's blood, how much more? Let me skip down to verses 21 and 22. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood. <coughs> And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And then chapter 10, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And then there are countless other places that we'll see that talk about the importance of his blood. It wasn't an accident that he shed his blood. It was essential. It was essential. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so, God didn't change what was going to take care of sin, even though it had to be his own son's blood. Yeah. He still, still yeah. kept the same thing yeah. consistent through all the different ages. Yeah, that's true. It's always been where the, where the life was, the life force. Uh, and just looking at it, it's the blood of Christ which cleanses one's sins. And we won't read all of these, but most of them you know... Uh, what it's talking about, his blood was shed for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28. That's when he institutes the Lord's Supper in the upper room. He's a propitiation for sins by his blood. Again, his blood is what does it. People are justified by his blood. I want to read that one in particular. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Justified by His blood, pronounced not guilty by His blood. We're innocent now because of His blood. Sounds like it's essential. Sounds like it's pretty important. Those who were once alienated because of their sins are made near by the blood of Christ. That goes back to Ephesians chapter 2 where he talks about the difference between the Gentiles and the Jews. Where those who were far off, the Gentiles, are now reconciled by his blood. And that text talks about how there was that middle wall of partition that, was, that separated the Jew and Gentile. Well, that was destroyed by his blood. Now they're all reconciled in one body by his blood, all in that same text in Ephesians chapter 2. Sounds like his blood is necessary. Redemption, the forgiveness of sins, is through his blood. We talked about that last week and read that verse. People have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Christ. Let's go and read Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. 
It's his blood that provides access to the holiest. That's what paves the way so that we can be in the holiest. 1 John 1, 7, His blood cleanses us from all sin. That's if, we're, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And sinners are washed of their sins by His blood. By His blood. So to say that the blood of Christ isn't important and wasn't essential is to contradict every single one of those verses. Yes. That's right. That's right. Without it, there is no forgiveness. There's no redemption. There's no cleaning. There's no cleansing. None of it at all. And very, very important. Let's read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. I only have about five minutes left, but Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Verse 8 begins, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. There's that phrase about obeying, about obedience. We must obey Christ. If we are going to be saved, the author of eternal salvation, the one who provides it, the source, the origin... We must obey Him. And then, on top of that, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We must accept His words and obey them. It's not just accepting them, not just believing them. Obedience must follow. Obedience must follow. And... The location of redemption is in Christ. Redemption can be found in no other person or place than Jesus Christ. Salvation is not found in anyone other than Christ. That's what Acts 4.12 says. For one to be redeemed, he must be in Christ because that's where all spiritual blessings are. Ephesians 1.3. He starts a whole paragraph there in verse 3 talking about all the blessings found in Christ. Redemption and forgiveness and all of those. Obedience to the gospel and its commands for the salvation of the soul, including the command to be baptized, puts one into Christ. Puts one into Christ. Galatians chapter 3. And that's where we'll stop. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. He says... For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So all sons of God are in Christ Jesus. That's where it's found. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So those people in Christ Jesus got there. The final act was baptism. That's what placed them into Christ where all spiritual blessings are, where salvation is, where redemption is. All found in Christ, nowhere else. So redemption from sins does not take place until one is baptized into Christ. It does not take place until that act. Uh, so again, until obedience takes place. All right, well, our time is up. And thank you for your participation and your help. And Lord willing, we'll be looking at a, a different basic concept next week.